Well, this is a little bit longer story in three parts uh, for an art dealer. This art dealer is um, selling in Adelaide but buying in the upper regions. So the writer was sitting with uh, his uh, friend, let's say a friend, Rolf, and see. Ralph and I were having an evening drink when one <coughs> of Estrella's nurses came running over to say there was a man on the radio telephone. I hoped it was a caddy. After all, my outpouring on paper, I longed for a session of his cool appraising talk. We both hurried over to the dispensary, only to find it was not a man in the air, but a very gruff-voiced woman. Eileen Houston of the Aboriginal Arts Bureau. What? Mm. You will complain, this uh, focus, uh, focusing thing. Eileen Houston of the Aboriginal Arts Bureau in Sydney. Has Winston finished his painting yet? Oh, she growled. Has Winston finished his painting yet? She growled, yes. He has, Rolf said. Okay, tell him I'll be over at nine sharp. The line went dead. Bitch, said Rolf. Winston Yapurla, Yapurla, <laughs> the most important artist working at Cullen, had only the week before completed a major canvas and was waiting for Mrs. Houston to come and buy it from him. Like many artists, he was generous with handouts and had run up a big debt at the store. Mrs. Houston, who described herself as a doyen of dealers and Aboriginal art, had the habit of driving round settlements to check up on her artists. She brought them paint and brushes and the canvas and would pay for finished work by check. She was a very determined woman. She always camped in the bush alone and was never not in a hurry. Never not. Means always. Next morning, Winston was waiting for her. Cross-legged, naked to the waist, on a patch of level ground beside the petrol drums. He was an aging voluptuary, with roots of fat spilling over his paint spattered shorts, and an immense drown curving mouth. His sons and grandsons bore the stamp of his magnificent ugliness. He was doodling a monster on a scrap of card. He had acquired, by osmosis, the temperament and mannerisms of the Lower West Broadway. He is policeman, or ritual manager, a young man in brown slacks called Bobby, was on hand to make sure Winston didn't leak any sacred knowledge. At nine sharp, the boys sighted Mrs. Houston's red land cruiser coming up the airstrip. She got out, walked towards the group, and set her own tress on the camping stool. Morning, Winston, she nodded. Morning, he said, without moving. She was a big woman in beige battle dress. Her scarlet sun hat, like a tupi, was ramped down over her head 
of graying curls, her pale heat-ravaged cheeks tapered off into a very pointed chin. What we are waiting for? she asked. I thought I'd come to see a painting. Ah. Winston fiddled with his hair string and, with a wave, deputed his grandson to fetch it from the store. Six of them came back, carrying a large stretched canvas, say seven foot by five, protected from the dust with a clear plastic sheet. They sat in gingerly on the ground and they set it gingerly on the ground and uh, unwrapped it. Mrs. Uh, Houston blinked. I watched her holding back a smile of pleasure. She had commissioned Winston to paint a white picture. But this, I think, was beyond her expectations. So many Aboriginal artists used strident color schemes. Here simply were six white to creamy white circles painted in meticulous pointless dots on a background which varied from the white to bluish white to the pale ochre. In the spaces between the circles there were a few snake-like squiggles in an equal pale lilac gray. So you wait for the next part, you will get it. Oh. Or not? Yeah. If you open, if you open the, <laughs> if you open the next story, yeah. Okay. If you're interested. <laughs>